Uber Eats, the app, the standalone Uber Eats app was actually built just down the street from here. So Toronto was actually the launch city for Uber Eats. Someone that I had met um, in my VC days reached out to me and said, hey, look, there's this early stage business around cars. You're delivering food. Mm. You should deliver cars. To me, it seemed insane that um, in order to go buy a car, you'd either go to a, a local dealership yeah. and spend five to six hours on a Saturday if you have kids, drag them along and have them running around. Or you meet some stranger in a Tim Hortons parking lot. And you hand over it, a wad of cash. Yeah, and then, you know, and hope that goes okay, right? So those yeah. are the two, those are literally the only two options. We are a two-sided marketplace for used car sales. I joined in 2019. Since that year, we have 25x revenue. Wow. Um, so it's been pretty exponential growth. I think it took me three weeks to close my Series B. For cool. Series B? Yeah. How big? So we did a $75 million equity round, and then we tacked down a $150 million debt line to that too. $150 million debt line. Debt line. Yeah. Founded in 2017, StartWell is Toronto's independent hub for innovators to collaborate. Our podcasts relate perspectives from the world's most diverse urban population to reflect unique insights into global business, media, and culture. Before we start, I have oh. something for you. Is that something to read on air? Is well, a little bit, is? but not really. Okay. It's, it's a very brief thing. Oh. So I... I so I don't know if you remember. This is this is this will be fun. This is fun. Okay. So I don't know if you remember, but is it like a check. No. Underneath? So if, if I think we reconnected when was like before pandemic, right? Right. Well, I saw you. Yeah, because I saw you at. Wait, was that no? That was during pandemic. Yeah, maybe. So you that like Techtio Spring Social. Yeah, but then you reminded like me. You're like, hey, look, like we were at we ran for Smoo together. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And so is that from the Tribune or something? Oh my god. <laughs> Yes, you're right. I totally forgot about this again. So I pulled it up. Oh my can, And wait, can I just read the one quote? Because I yes. feel like it's very please, appropriate. Please do it's, read this. This is interesting. It's very appropriate for this okay, podcast. So frame this it for our... Because right, so, we'll cut this into the episode. Yeah. All right. So this... So oh my God. 20 years ago. Well, more than 20 years ago at this point. Back in 98, 99? 98, 98. No, no. It was like 2000, 2001. So okay. just over 20 years ago. Wow. We both ran for SMU. That's uh, Student Council student, and McGill. McGill. Yeah. Basically school government, student government. And I thought this was a, a very uh, appropriate quote for to start up podcast. Please. So this favorite quote, the face of a child can say it all, especially the mouth part of the face. <laughs> that was your favorite quote. <laughs> so. Oh, that's great. So I get asked by the newspaper, uh, all the candidates running for a particular position in student council. Give us an inspiring quote to yeah. show us how intellectual you are. Uh, wait, wait, who is it? Who is it by? Probably like Jack Handy. Jack Handy. Yes. Right? So this is like yes. Saturday Night Live from the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Honestly, you got to counterbalance the like the wit with the uh, with the humor. Exactly. Right? No. So that's that's how far we go back in theory. Damn, uh, man, so, yeah, we do. So we go crazy? way back. Twenty years. More. We got to hang out, man. I know, right? Damn, yeah. that's what happens. Yeah, I know. Lots uh, has happened since. Lots uh, exactly. will continue to happen. Exactly. Man. Okay, let's talk business. Yep. And life, and jump into it. Yeah. So, Dad Park, welcome to the studio, man. Oh, thanks for having me. This is awesome. It is a pleasure. And as we just uh, as we just <laughs> talked about, our story goes back, you know, twenty plus, 20 plus years. years. Yeah. yeah, same university, Montreal. That's right. Went to different cities post that, different career experiences. Yep. At McGill, at university, what what did you do for a degree? I did business, so I okay. was a commerce guy. So see, I started in commerce as well. Yeah, I was doing starting my BCom, and then like a week in. I liked my electives more and yeah. I went that way and then it took me two years to officially transfer into arts and like then I did a degree in I life. have the opposite story. I actually oh, started right. in arts oh. and then moved to business. That's interesting. Yeah. And then you got, you you actually, I didn't really get a job after university immediately. I had to go into business to like, you know, not because I couldn't get a job, but you got a job. I did. Well, it was, a, it was an interesting time, right? Because we were graduating... Uh, well, at least I was graduating September. It was September. Like, the recruiting season was September mm. of 2001. Um, so I remember 9-11. I was in the school cafeteria watching that happen. Uh, and, you know, obviously devastating. Um, sure. But from a job perspective, no one, very few people got jobs. And I was right. lucky enough to get one. Um, so moved to Bay Street, did a year of investment banking, uh, and then moved to New York, uh, where I spent 
the next eight years. Wait a second. When yeah. did you move to New York? I moved in 2005. Oh, okay. I moved to New York in 2004. Okay. I left in 2005. Okay. I lived in Harlem. Okay. I worked uh, in Greenwich Village. All right. And then uh, and then opposite NYU on uh, like Broadway, West Broadway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. just about a year before I moved to Toronto. Yeah. So I lived, office was in the financial district, so it was literally on Wall Street. And so uh, I had a kind of a dorm-like apartment on, just beside Wall Street. So it was, that was my, I spent a lot of time at the office though. Man. And did you dig it for the years that you were in New York? Yeah, I loved it. On... Yeah, no, I loved it. I went back after business school um, and uh, and then met my wife in business school. And then we both looked at each other, said, you're Canadian, I'm Canadian. We should have kids. We should have those kids in Canada. And we moved back to Canada. Um, and you've back been in, in Toronto. Uh, moved to Calgary for okay. a little bit and then was in San Francisco prior to that. Oh. Uh, so kind of bounced around North America, but then eventually settled in Toronto back in 2016, 14, so 15. Calgary was another random interconnection because yeah. I think that's where we reconnected at, uh, the, for the first time after McGill. Because I, at the time, perhaps if I have this correct, was with Softlayer running their startup program. Okay. Yeah. And there was some sort of like, um, I forget what it was called. Wasn't there a body that, that brings together like X Valley or Valley people from Alberta? Sort of like the C100, but for Alberta? Oh, there's an A100. That's it. Yes. So there was an A100 event that I had gone to. Right. And I think you were there. And this must have been 2050, 14, 15. And that's when I met, like, ago. and yeah. became friends with Pat Lohr. And yeah. so now every time yeah. I go back to Calgary, yeah. we hang out. Yeah, yeah, that's when we met, too. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. funny. Yeah, small world. Right? I mean, extremely Canadian small. tech is a very small world. It's a big country filled with very few people. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but we're all pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and then, so, like, you fast forward to, so like, you know, working in, in kind of, like, banking. Yeah. And then you went out to the Valley for a bit. Yeah, so I broke into the VC um, back in 2013, and that's kind of my journey to San Francisco and, and then eventually to Calgary to help run a fund based out of SF, mm-hmm. uh, start a Canadian business. And so my job was about 60% sourcing new deal flow in Canada and then 40% in the US. And so I'd commute actually back and forth from San Francisco on a monthly basis. Wow. Um, but learned a ton. VC was probably... Uh, one of the more intellectually stimulating jobs that I've had in my career because you're meeting entrepreneurs every day um, and talking about business models. Uh, but the real, I mean, I, I, and, and I think this is a very much a personal feeling, but I, I very much felt like a imposter. Why you is know? that? I'm a finance guy. I'm meeting with these entrepreneurs trying to build business, trying to provide advice. You know, my real only value add is capital. Um, so you wanted to be more, I, but that probably is what the imposter syndrome was. Like you yeah. wanted to dig in more into the businesses and have more. Well, I, that and also, you know, to sit across the table from an entrepreneur that's trying to build a business, going through problems, scaling, hiring people, structuring teams, figuring out strategic direction, all those things, you know, hard to opine on when, you know, for the last five years, you've been a finance guy. Right. Um, and so, you know, I knew something about finance and raising capital and what your balance sheet should look like. But yeah. I think the day-to-day ops is really hard to help with. And frankly, I think, you know, a VC spends most of their time across eight to 10 companies in their portfolio. So the reality is that even the best VCs can't be fully immersed in a business. Otherwise, they're probably not doing their job properly. And so, right. um, but for me, I, it felt like I was missing that 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 perspective to help entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, that's when Uber back in 2015 was... Yeah experimenting around putting stuff in cars. Travis Travis was still there at the time. That's and the founder, right? He was the founder, Travis Kalnick. And uh, he was like, well, we can get the car to show up in five minutes. What else can we put in a car and deliver to people? And so we started putting you know, groceries, toilet paper, toothpaste, food, um, to see if there were any signals. And so it turns out that people wanted food on demand. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, initially I was hired... My official title, I think, was GM of Uber Everything in Canada. Uber Everything, I remember that. And that yeah. was just their catch-all for, like, what can everything, we do? What well, else can we do? Yeah, everything that wasn't rides, effectively. Um, and when when we, when they would present us on town halls, you know, here's the pie charts of, like, the two businesses. Yeah. It would be, they call it core and non-core. Okay. Uh, and so if there's a way to make people feel 
non-important it's or unimportant you call them non-core uh, so we were you're everything you're everything, <laughs> everything to us everything to us but you're non-core so that but we were the we were the weird and if you have talked to anyone that was at uber back in the early days and the eats particularly on the eats business we were the, the weird people in the corner of the office trying yeah. to deliver food while like the rides business was doing what they were doing uh and so, so the kool-aid was about killing the taxi industry or or bettering it well, I think it was providing reliable transportation, right? That's well phrased. That yes. was that was that was the that was the mission. I think the mission, the official mission, was to provide transportation as reliable as running water. Okay. Um, that changed over time, but that was that was Travis's north star. Yeah. Um, but then we evolved to food, and the initial iteration of Uber Eats was I don't know if you remember this back in like 2015. It was called Uber Instant. And it no, was, I don't remember. It that. was in the Uber Rides app where you could, uh, you know, you can pick. Now you can pick Uber X or Black or, you know, Green. Now, a bit back then, there was a food, and we'd stuff a bunch of uh, Ubers. So we'd go. There's a couple. There's four parking lots around the city. <laughs> so we'd meet the bunch of drivers. They'd line up, and we'd stuff a, 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 an Uber with like 15 pad ties, and then the next driver would come. We'd stuff another 15 pad ties in. And then they drive around the city, uh, and you would order them on demand. Just waiting for people to ask for, for uh, a pad thai. Well, there was like four uh, every day. There was four or five menu items. So oh, there was like burgers from Burgers Priest. There was like you know pad thai from Pai. Uh -huh. and there was you know curry from Sukutai. Like there was like five or six menu items. Yeah, it would drive around, and then you know at the end of the day, some cars would be sold out in an hour. Some cars would not have sold anything. Inventory planning was a nightmare. Yeah, it was just uh, an experiment. Though. It was just an experiment. Every day we'd show up, okay, I guess we're all having pad thai for dinner because no one ordered it. And so a lot of spoilage. Uh, and we realized quickly that that wasn't scalable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But it turns out that people really wanted food on demand. Um, and so... Uh, that's was when, that just in Canada, or was this something happening? This globally? was happening globally, but then Uber Eats, the app, the standalone Uber Eats app, was actually built just down the street from here. Um, oh, in a conference room back in 2015. That. It was launched in December 2015. I joined a few months later after wow. it was launched. Okay. At the time, it was running both. We were running the the, the standalone app, but we were also running the instant business. Um, and that launched. Hmm. Uh, so Toronto was actually the launch city for Uber Eats in Canada oh, and wow. globally. That's globally. very interesting. Um, and so there was a lot of Canadian DNA uh, around the Uber Eats business, um, around leadership, around, you know, just generally globally. Um, was that by design or was that by happenstance? Like by happenstance, because was... we launched it in Toronto, right? Yeah. And so um, Toronto for a long time was the largest Uber Eats city in terms of number of delivery, deliveries for Uber globally. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, not New York, where not New York. No well, one has a kitchen. The 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 for the first two years, it wasn't New York. It wasn't London. Um, and frankly, we always said, look, if Toronto ends up being the largest Uber Eats city globally, something's gone wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it is isn't anymore. But for a long time, it was just because it was first. It was the first cohort. Wow. Um, and so, um, and we scaled. By the time I left, we were doing a million deliveries a week in Canada. Um, and so. It was an incredible ride. That that business, the Uber Eats business, grew faster than the rides business. And the rides business, in theory, was the fastest growing business of all time, at least at the time. Right. Um, and so the growth rate was incredible, exponential. Um, and um, built a consumer brand. You know, learned a lot around. I mean, Uber had didn't have a consumer like a customer. It was never a cut, really. B two B facing business, and sure. so restaurant acquisition had to be done, right. had to be built. Um, so sales teams had to be built, customer experience and s customer service had to be built. And um, it was new terroir, right? Because like that whole food on demand thing yeah, wasn't yeah. concerted. It was always like each restaurant handling their own delivery if yep. need be. Yep. And Barely. and, and that would be like someone running out to send it down that road. Exactly. And now you know, fast forward, you know, whatever it is, ten not years, many years, eight years, not yeah, not even ten years, eight years. Um, it's now just part of the culture and how we function as a crazy? society which is kind of cool yeah um, it's crazy if, if if we were sitting here as like what i don't know 22 year olds yeah we wouldn't know a reality as adults other than relying on uber well, i mean when we were back in mcgill we'd yeah. 
phone Mikey's for the chicken Caesar wrap. Mikey. <laughs> Love the record show. I never phoned that up from Mikey. <laughs> Ate it twice in my tenure at McGill, but yeah, yeah. that was pretty creamy and yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So there was one guy that delivered food. It was like the one item, right? It was. It's yeah, true. There yeah, was like yeah, one dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, we learned a lot. And, and the, I remember distinctly there was this long debate on whether or not we should have fast food on the platform or not. Interesting. And, and the... And now it seems so obvious that people want McDonald's on demand, but at the time... Because they were thinking like cheap food means no margin. Well, cheap food, no margin, but also it's fast food. Why do you want fast food delivered? Just go and pick up fast food, right? Right. And um, so there was this long debate whether we need to get McDonald's or not. And then eventually we obviously did because it's on the platform. Yeah. And then within 30 days, top. 10 restaurants from McDonald's locations. That's incredible. Um, and people, and it was, it was accessing a very different demographic of people. It also teaches you things about food, right? So what were the main lessons you learned about food and people's appetites? Um, I think people really value con- convenience. Uh, I think that's a, uh, maybe seems obvious now, but people, I think the, the most active Uber single, not business, but you know, individual Uber Eats eater ordered six, 700 times a year. Um, twice a day, twice maybe. a day. Yeah. One person, one person. Right. Um, wow. And so, you know, people value convenience, um, like speed. I think I learned a lot about operations because the importance of speed is very important in food delivery because if you're slow, it's cold and it spoils. So there's speed and, and having everything really tight from an operating perspective. That goes um, from educating the vendor as well on packaging, yep, right? Yep. Packaging, um, driver interaction, preparation, using the technology. Yeah. Um, and the technology was evolving on both sides. So it like, was. I mean, probably slower than you'd probably expect. Okay. I think the, the other thing I learned, and I think Uber was really good at that, was actually leading with operations and not with product. Okay. Product is definitely the one of the most expensive engineers are some of the most expensive hires you'll have at a company um, engineers uh, it takes time to build and design product uh, and test it and so we would operationally hack things in Google Sheets or manually or throw people at the problem right to be able to fill the gap that product would was supposed to fill sure and we do that for years until we knew that okay, this is the process that we are and what we are using to solve this problem. Right. And then okay, now we can build product around that problem. Yeah. Um, Take it to engineering. Yeah. It's product so, tested. But it took it, it's took, ready to go. it took a while. It took a while, but I think that's the right answer because so often I think this is a mistake a lot of startups make. Mm-hmm. Um, they just you know they just build product they for the sake of building product, right? Absolutely. The, yeah. The initial the initial product version of Uber was. Um, you know, ads that said, call this number and we'll get you a car, right? Uh, there was no app. Um, it's limo service. It was basically limo service on demand. And so there's yeah. someone on that picked up the phone and be like, okay, you know, pick up Jim on this corner at two o'clock, please. And then, gypsy cab. Yeah, right? So, yeah. In Harlem, that's yeah. what we had. We had yeah. gypsy cab. Yeah, there you go. They cruise by, you'd be yeah. like, yeah. 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 <laughs> some, some weird hand stuff. And then they take you downtown. Yeah, yeah. So Hopefully you survive. <laughs> Um, so yeah, product, I think that, that was definitely learning that applies, uh, that applied, you know, to my work, certainly a clutch, but you know, also, you know, as I, I'm still investing in startups, but I look at startups right. with a different lens as well. And you were at Uber for how long? Uh, just over three years. Wow. Yeah. So at what point was it that you were like, okay, I need to do something different or I, I want to move <clears throat> on? Yeah, it was, uh, I probably had another year or two left. Um, I felt like I, we, we accomplished a ton. We, we, uh, we launched all this. We launched, I think we launched something like 100 different cities in Canada or 100 different markets in Canada. Yeah, like all the markets. All the markets. <laughs> it's like every city All the markets. Um, we signed all the biggest kind of franchise um, restaurant operate, uh, locations. Sure, um, sure. And so um, there was a few other things that I wanted to achieve, but actually uh, uh, someone that I had met um, in my VC days reached out to me and said, hey, look, there's this early stage business around cars. You're delivering food. Mm. You should deliver cars. I'm like, well, I don't know if that's the same Scale's thing. Scale's a little different. A little different, you know, um, not as frequent. Uh, but there are probably more similarities than you think. Um, but he approached me and said, hey, look, there's this business. They need some leadership. Um, they've launched one market. 
uh, precede at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so and Clutch so existed. It did exist. Yeah, were, yeah. I thought you the, you found no, it. no, no. I, uh, so I joined up. I teamed up with Steve Seibel, who's the founder. Okay. Um, he started about eighteen months, two years before I joined. Um, and I think we share the same vision around building a consumer retail business around what we think is the second largest consumer category that mm-hmm. exists. Right in Canada, to to me, it seemed insane that. Um, in order to go buy a car, you'd either go to a, a local dealership yep. and spend five to six hours on a Saturday if you have kids, drag them along and have them running around. And you don't get to focus. Negotiate yeah. and have like, you know, people being like, you got to buy this thing. You know, it's this protection package. That, that, that was the, I mean, that's the how I bought cars in the yeah. past, right? Or you meet some stranger in a Tim Hortons parking lot. Exactly. And you and hand tra- over a wad of cash. Yeah. And then, you know, and then... You, you know, go for a ride with him and hope that goes okay, right? So those yeah. are the two; those are literally the only two options. Are all were the only two options that existed, uh, that exist in Canada. Whereas in the U.S., there's companies like CarMax and, mm. and Carvana and AutoNation. There's a bunch of brands, um, some that are more regional, um, that you know have multiple locations that have a consistent customer experience, have a standard for 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 cars. Uh, that when something or if something goes wrong, you can go back and be like, "Hey, look, this didn't meet the standard," and you can have that discussion with whoever you're talking to. That didn't exist, and we felt like that needed to exist in Canada. Um, it's one of the biggest purchases you'll make as an individual, mm-hmm. and the options that you have didn't feel very 2020, uh, well, at the time, 2019. Um, but they certainly don't feel very 2023 anymore either. So 2019, this is the year before the great pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> where was the company when you joined in terms of like their operations? What were your... What were they doing? Yeah, so we were um, we were uh, in one market in Halifax because Halifax was the only well. So what Halifax? Halifax. So Steve, uh, we couldn't get a license in Ontario. So a business license, uh, uh, a motor vehicle license to sell cars. So so car dealerships are a regulated industry. Who would have thought? And regulated in Ontario by uh, I don't know, a body called OMVIC, Ontario Motor Vehicle Industry Council. Okay. Alberta, there's AMVIC. There's you know, everyone, every different province has a different regulatory body. Mm-hmm. Um, Nova Scotia actually has one of the loosest regulations around um, car sales. Okay. Um, and so we were able to get a dealer license pretty quickly there. Okay. Uh, and it was the only, it was, it was, you know, Steve was like, okay, never been to Halifax before in his life. Yeah. Um, look for a direct flight to the closest market that had the easiest access to dealer license. And he launched the market. Um, did he buy a dealership or no, did no, no, he, he, he got a fresh license? Fresh license. Like went line, a, lined up somewhere, put down five bucks and got a license. Got a license effectively. And yeah. then got some cars, built a website and started selling cars online. Wow. Um, so it was a virtual dealership. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't like using the word dealership because dealership, by definition, has a relationship with an OEM mm-hmm. and suggests there's a middle person, right? We are a two-sided marketplace for used car sales. Okay, so f- let's talk about what happened from Halifax to you joining and then the pandemic. Yeah, so um, we pro- we have we have, since that, year we have 25 x revenue um, wow. so it's been pretty exponential growth um and in terms of territories and like getting yeah so here's there. the here's the story so we lay it on me so we uh so we jo- i joined in 2019 and uh one of the first things i said is we can't launch toronto right we can't we can't we got to figure out how to launch toronto we can't be a vc backed highly skilled company without launching in Canada's biggest market. Yeah. Um, and so I uh, spent a lot of time with regulators. Um, and this kind of goes back to some of the Uber days around, you know, some of the, the regulatory overhang that you had to overcome. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we um, uh, eventually got a license. It was not without some challenges, but we eventually got a, a license and we started launching. We launched and we started selling cars and then okay. raised a seed round in March Okay. Um, after we had secured the license, March, March 2020. 2020, right? We closed literally days before the pandemic really exploded. Yeah. Um, Janet Bannister at Real Ventures. Uh, and for our listeners, this is the lady who founded Kijiji. Yes, she founded Kijiji. Yeah. Saw the opportunity. Kijiji. Oh yeah. And again, Kijiji. for our listeners, yes. sorry. A lot of people listen to our show and watch it from out of Canada. Yes. So Kijiji is our largest like eBay. web. 
Yeah. Yeah. eBay bought it. eBay bought it, yeah. And it's essentially like or a classified ads. Craigslist, eBay. Yeah. yeah. Online classified Online. ads. In Canada. Okay, so tell me, Janet Bannister, sorry, what? Took a bet and was like, hey, look, I saw the opportunity in auto. Kijiji Autos was a huge business. Yeah, it right? still is. Still right? is a huge business. Guess, yeah. yeah. And I've bought cars from Kijiji. Yep. And that's a mark that's a marketplace. That's an unmanaged marketplace. And the world was moving to managed marketplaces right. where consumers were asking for a higher level of trust, mm-hmm. more validation for the product, a more seamless customer interaction, as opposed to just being connected with buyer and seller. They wanted someone a brand in between that could help them facilitate that transaction. Sure. And so um, pandemic happened. Basically, car sales went to effectively zero. Yeah. And a big right. part of that was cars sitting on people's driveways and they're saying, wow, wow. I don't yep. need to go to work anymore. Yep. I'm uh, paying insurance on And this I'll never thing. need to go to work again. Right. <laughs> That's, I mean, that was the prevailing thought back then, I think, right? I think so. I think in, in 2020, a lot of people, especially because, you know, we've covered this in different angles with different people on the show that yeah. um, the GTA, the greater Toronto area being so large in its uh, physicality, uh, we have a big commuter. In fact, half almost of the city's working force was a commuter traffic. Yeah. Yeah. So three million people weren't coming into the city right. every day. Right. And the people that were in the city, the three other three million, were not leaving their houses. Yeah. So yeah, people yeah. who own cars were kind of like, well, I don't need I don't this anymore, need this. right? Or no, or at least I don't need this. I certainly don't need to buy a new one. Yeah, right. And yeah. so uh, car sales went to zero, and then all of a sudden, you know, people didn't love the idea of being on public transit, right? Yeah, anymore with they, each other, right? They didn't love ride sharing anymore, right? And they wanted to go, you know, up north or you know, go for a hike, get groceries themselves. You know that, and so people were like, "We need cars," and right. and and car sales took off um, in the fall of 2020. Really, oh wow, that um, was a, that soon. I would. It was think, very quick. Okay. Um, so we really only had like three months of, I would say, real uncertainty, and then mm-hmm. it went crazy. Um, and then we raised a 20 million dollars Series A round within a couple of months from a local fund, or no, from a U.S. based fund, Canaan okay. Partners. Okay. Um, and at that point, we had probably, we doubled. Um, in terms of staff? In ter- no, count. in terms of revenue. Oh. Uh, in terms of revenue. Um, so wait, where were you finding your cars? I should ask that. I didn't ask that. Where yeah, you, so where, where that point the initial model to scale was to buy through auctions, right? And okay. that's how you, st- it was actually a very efficient way to scale because buying, particularly without a brand or any real process, it was really hard to buy one-off cars from individual consumers. Yeah, so time consuming and expensive. So t- exactly. And so now, so back then we would go to auctions and we'd buy 40, 50 cars at a time, right? Um, These are like X fleet from rental companies? Fleet, it's, police seizure. Well, there few, fewer of those. It was mostly ex-fleet um, from rental companies. It was also um, a lot of the dealerships that don't want the they car. They can't move the product. Well, it's, you know, they're Mercedes dealerships and they have a Toyota Camry, right? Sure. Um, and so it just doesn't fit their business. Right. And so there's a lot of auction cars. And so that, that's how, that's where we get our most of our supply. Today, we actually acquire almost no none, I would say none of our cars from auctions. And so we built a full, fully two-sided marketplace where we acquire all of our cars from individual consumers. Um, um, okay, so people now discover you to be able to list their car directly. Well, they se- no, they sell. We basically make right. the market, right? right? So we give. So we built a lot of technology, um, and effectively, each make model uh, trim has its own machine learning model where we ingest a bunch of data and we real-time price cars so that we can provide an instant cash offer to the consumer mm. or the user. Um, and so if you go online and go to our website, you could put in your de- vehicle details. It's just your VIN and some you know, mileage information. Right. Ask about 10 questions and we'll spit out an instant cash offer for your car. I like it. And because we're at scale, you know, we don't need to ask for photos. We don't need to all do, there's, and, and we don't need to, you know, we, we, we've, we've fine tuned our models so that we on average have, uh, you know, a small, but I would say healthy margin for this business. Uh, and, and we can pay more than dealerships because of our scale. And, uh, okay. So let's just go down this road. We'll come yep. back to kind of pandemic and history, but so current state, I want to sell my car. I put in my VIN number to yep. the website and the right. URL is uh, clutch.ca clutch.ca. Um, so I put in the VIN number and it says, blah, 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 blah. Yep. Bleep, bleep, bloop, bloop. Yep. And then it spits out a price. Price. And it's like, Kasim, here's 40,000 bucks. Yep. Um, and I'm like, cool. How do I receive the money? So you and how either, do I give you the car? 
schedule a drop off or a pickup. Yeah. Um, and within two to three business days, you have a month funds directly deposited in your business or your bank, bank transfer. Done. Easy. Yep. Wow, that's fantastic. Yep. But now, what are the what's the small print? There's no small print. What are what, what, what is the what is your perceived small print? In terms of condition of car and stuff, like if I give you a dead body in the back of my car, yeah. You know, so like, will yeah. you take that on? And so they dispose of it for me. There's a few. There's about ten or twelve questions that you ask that are, that are asked. Yeah. Um, I think the the most interesting one is modification. So a lot of people put mm. like they put a you know a, a huge spoiler on the back or right. you know they they mod their car and, yeah. and they're like I put this money into the car. Oh, oh this is like higher value. And you're like, no, no, we need actually, stock. it's not. Yeah. It actually re- modifications on a car actually reduce the value of the car. And so there's situations like that. Okay, but okay. as long as consumers are honest about the condition of their vehicle. Mm. The mileage they disclose, like we do an accident check. If they disclose the accident, they will get, they will 100% get the value, the value that they, but you know, sometimes the occasional customer comes in and says, vehicle is in excellent condition. And then like the door is bashed in and you're like, right. well, that's not excellent. But like, well, that just happened when I was on the way here. Yeah. Like, well, but I would say 99% of consumers are very honest about the condition of their vehicle because otherwise, yeah. you know, they, it, upon drop off, you know, we're seeing the car. And what are the, um, I guess, what age range uh, of car and I guess rarity? Like you're looking for cars that can move. So it's, it's going to yeah, be Yeah. So we'll buy cars. everything, um, but only about 40% of our cars that we buy meet our retail standard. That's interesting. So yeah. what do you do with the cars that you buy? So that's that where they sell? go to auction. Ah, yeah. Very interesting. And that does that include like vintage and rare and like McLaren? Yeah, and we stuff? get fewer of those, but um, in theory, yes. Because I, I have an old Porsche I want to possibly move. Yeah, we're probably not the right. Okay. I mean, there's, yes, but, uh, you know, for, 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 for the average vehicle, um, yeah, that it, it makes a ton of sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, let's rewind a little bit. Yeah. Okay, and come back to 2020 tw- into 21. Yeah, into 21. And then I think then uh, that was the height of... Uh, used car. Well, used appetite. car, but also just tech generally, right? That was the height of all tech. Uh, late 2021, early 2022 was when things were, frankly, as hot as I've seen them. In terms of willingness for VCs to invest. To invest, exactly, okay. right? Um, you know, for our Series B round, I think we've got six or seven term sheets and um, at valuations that were, you know, astronomical, um, and that wasn't just us. I think that was happening. It was there all was, over. There the was, you know, there were SaaS businesses with a million dollars of revenue being funded at two hundred and fifty million dollar valuation. Right? You're like, okay, right. Um, and so there was just a lot of euphoria then. Um, I think it took me three weeks to close my Series B. That's short um, for short. Series B. Yeah. How big? Seventy five million. That's in uh, equity. In equity. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So we did a $75 million equity round, and then we tacked down a $150 million debt line to that, too. $150 million debt, debt line. Debt line, yeah. But your largest costs were product inventory. acquisition. Yeah, inventory. And, then, and so that's what we use debt to fund, right? right? So we right. used, basically, it's working capital inventory financing mm. um, to fund the inventory. Um, and so uh, that was that was crazy. And, and I remember my head of finance was like, oh, this is this is fun. And I'm like, well, this is, this is not going to last. Um, yeah, and yeah. so I think we stayed, we didn't take the highest valuation. So I'm grateful for that. Um, and, uh, we stayed, uh, disciplined and, and, and pretty humble about, you know, the yeah. fact that keep that you know, cash this, in the bank. Yeah. Well, we did as well as we could, but at the same time, there was this immense pressure to grow from, um, from VCs. Right. And so we had grown so for, we grew, fi- for future rounds. Well, just generally growth. I mean, growth is what drives returns for VCs, right? And so, you know, the 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 first board meeting said, "Here's all this cash. Let's go grow as fast as you possibly can." There's another hundred million dollars waiting behind us. Mm-hmm. This, right? And so, just go. And we had a competitor. You know, we were launching our markets. We were raising money. They were launching markets. They were raising mm-hmm. money. And there was this like race. And it was very. Very reminiscent of my Uber Eats skip the dishes sure. back in growth 20, at all right? costs. Growth at all costs. You know, at one point we were you know, we we're burning, you know, a lot of money every time we sent out a trip in at Uber Eats, and so you know there was some of the similarities. Right. And so we had we had constraints. We said, okay, well, let's grow as fast as we possibly can, but the constraints are never never lose money on a car, right? Okay. 
Um, so losing money as a company generally because of the OPEX, but never lose money on the unit, right? Mm -hmm. And then keep customer experience. Uh, so we use NPS to measure our customer experience and keep that above 80. Um, and so those were the two constraints. But other than that, let's grow as fast as we can. Um, and then within three months, right, um, everything started to collapse. Um, our biggest comp in the U.S., their stock price declined by 90%. Um, but that's a stock market thing, or is that demand tanked? No, that's that was a market thing, right? Yeah. That was rates starting to increase, right. right? And VCs feeling super, super uncertain about where the next round was going to come from, okay. right? So you're not profitable. Great, I can find this round, but public markets are shutting down. Uh -huh. So that's that. Right. This is the thing that startup people don't quite get, is this like, once you're pumped a lot of capital as a company, mm -hmm. you really only have kind of two main paths down the road. You're either going public to raise capital from the public market to fuel the growth trajectory that you're on. Yep. Or you're looking for a merger and acquisition. Yep. So or large, you get profitable. Yeah, yeah, which never happens for like, if you raise hundreds and hundreds of millions, it's yeah. really tough to do that quickly. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of a scary position to be in. It's terrifying. Yeah. No, and I'm actually genuinely nervous for 2024 because so many companies, particularly around software, raised a lot of money in 2021, right? And now you've done everything you can or in terms of you've done probably some degree of headcount reduction. You've tried to increase prices. Mm -hmm. But if you're still burning, right, you need to go raise another round. And a lot of companies that raise in 2021 will start facing, you know, cash out in 2024. Um, and so we'll see where this whole startup ecosystem lands in the next, I would say, 12 to 24 months. But yeah. I think there's still some working out to happen. Um, so how does Clutch relate to foreign markets? And, and, and do you see other territories outside of Canada um, as opportunistic for the company? Um, I would say not in the immediate term. The The business and the reason why this is very much a, a localized business um, in a lot of different markets. And so there's been multiple companies across the world that have been successful in their individual markets. Mm -hmm. um, I truly believe this is a winner take most market. Um, okay. And so there's an incredible amount of infrastructure you need to build. Yep. Um, and so we are fully vertically integrated. We've got you know, a facility where we process each one of these cars, right? So we bring them in, we inspect them. These are clutch mechanics that inspect these wow, cars. Okay. We recondition them, we put new brakes, we put new tires, we put new filters in, we change fluids, anything cosmetic. They go through the photo process, they get listed on our website, and then they get inspected again, safety before going out to the consumer. And so Phenomenal. there's a, a there's a fully vertically, and then we have our own trucks and logistics because- You have to pick up and drop, drop off. Drop off and, and unlike, you know, a lot of other e-commerce companies that sell shoes or watches or shirts, yeah. we can't put our item in the UPS or <laughs> FedEx box, right? And, it just or, or load it onto a trailer for yeah. a guy who's like charging you by the hour because right. oh, you yeah. don't know if he's going to care. Or Yeah, and that's product. probably, one, and that's one of the other issues is the logistics in this space are very inconsistent because until recently, there hasn't been this need for this consumer expectation where if I ask for something, I want it now, mm -hmm. you know, if oftentimes when we try to ship a car and we're not using our own logistics, it's like, well, well you'll get it sometime in March. Yeah. Right? Well, like I was at the dealer with, um, with one of my cars cause it was winter last winter and the heating thing wasn't working yep. and it was fogging up and I'm like driving to the dealer <laughs> rather than going to my guys in Oakville that yep. I go to that race Porsches. So they know how to fix it really well. And they charge me an honest price and I'm going to the dealer and I get to the dealer and firstly, takes me three hours to just get an appointment with the mm -hmm. guy who's going to do an intake form. Yeah. I'm like, I could have done that online. Yeah. Secondly, he was a very nice guy and all the staff were very friendly and helpful, but there were limitations to how they could help me. Right. And, uh, and anyway, he starts talking and then, and, and I dropped the car off. It takes like five days to fix this very simple thing. Yeah. Um, and I was asking him, you know, about the new stock because he was like, look, are you interested in selling this car? Because we have a lot of interested buyers for used Porsches. Yeah. And uh, when I went to pick it up, in fact, he said there was one person who made an offer on my car. And I'm like, no, I don't want to sell it. And he's like, that's smart. That's smart. Because it's going to take about 18 months to get a new one. <laughs> and that's why people are like, you, yeah. know, you yeah. know, and they're going to the dealer first because they're looking for that authenticity or at least the, the what they assume is the 
that kind of seal of approval right, that right. like if you're buying a used car from the dealer, it's going to be as good as a new one. Well, yeah. maybe not, but yeah. Um, but that's that's a huge lag time. Yeah, yeah. No, it's. I mean, that's for a while. That's why new Teslas were actually old. Sorry, used Teslas were actually trading at a higher price than new Teslas, because oh, wow. I didn't know because that. it was you know six eight six to twelve months to get a new Tesla. Um, and so you see all these market dynamics, and yeah. and I think until you know we're trying to provide transparency around these prices because there's, I think this is a market where people have very little sense of how much that asset is worth, right? Absolutely. Um, people have I, next to no sense. No, exactly, right? Next to no sense. Um, and, and, and because of the way that financing and the depreciation works, right, you know, you can be oftentimes underwater on your on your car, right? mm-hmm. negative equity in your vehicle. And so I think from a financial perspective and to provide that financial education to consumers, knowing the value of that car is super important. And so we're, we're trying to provide that to consumers um, and give them a way to, you know, frankly, liquidate that asset. You mm-hmm. know, the way we think about this is, you know, in some ways, like a little bit of a hedge fund, right, where we've got assets that we're buying and selling, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. and we want to find great assets because the better the asset, the more the customer, customer will want to buy that asset, sure. right? Um, and we provide that value added. So we, you know, every car we sell comes with a 10-day money-back guarantee, Okay. And a 90-day complimentary warranty because we've taken that car, we've inspected it, we've certified it, we've reconditioned it, and we can guarantee you that car is going to be in the condition that we think it's going to be in because we've taken possession of that car. Well, whereas if you met some random person on one of the marketplace listing sites and you try to go and like, you know, meet them in a you, you breaks no down idea. on the way home and Who knows, that's right? on that's, you. That's on you, right? And yeah. so. That's the that's the trust and the level of experience we're trying to provide a consumer that we think is missing in in the Canadian market, mm-hmm. um, and the and the ultimate goal is to to build a brand. Um, and so we've done things like, you know, we're the official used car retailer of the NBA. Um, I saw that yeah. actually. So, you know, that's fun, right? And the, yeah. the clutch clutch brand goes well with you know clutch shots, and so there's you know a lot of work we're doing around that. And okay. So, um, but you know, we're trying to build a brand, a consumer brand around used car retail. And it's interesting because there's also, I would assume, a whole new uh, age set of buyers. Again, like talking about the people who are growing up with Uber. Yep. There may be people not, but yeah, growing up with Clutch. I yeah. mean, the question of the on-demand economy being preferable to figuring out how to go to Uncle Jim's used car dealer. Yeah. I mean, my favorite thing is going to bed and then waking up in the morning and seeing that we've sold a bunch of cars. I love right? that. Because I love I love the virtuality of of the transactions. Right, because well, right? that's I mean you could never have done that in the past, and it speaks to also consumer behavior around. Hey, look, like I want to be in front of my couch, I want to be able to look at the car. It's I mean I think we've done a great job with photos and being very transparent around the condition of the car. We call them hotspots, and so any time there is an imperfection, yeah, we will hotspot it, and so you can zoom in and see exactly what that is, and so. You know, it's hmm. happiness is about expectations being in reality, and so as long as we can set expectations, then you know people are pretty happy. Um, and then there's full vehicle history, and you can you know browse and buy online just like so you would. People with, can geek out on the yeah, data. Yeah. Right? Do you think um, that? Because this is something that I personally have as observed um, as someone who grew up in Canada, then at age 11 moved away to East Africa and hmm. came back in ninety. When did I come back? Ninety eight from McGill. Okay. When I came back, things had changed, and especially post-university, that there was an appetite for leasing. Mm. When I was a kid, no one leased their car. Right, right. right? They could either afford it or they bought used. Yep. Um, and still would have secondary financing probably, right? Yep. So how does leasing play into both the priming of the appetite to transact virtually, buy online? Yep. And then also to um, you know buy and sell cars. Yeah, I think I mean leasing is a great option for new for people that want new. Uh, it's an option. Um, my hypothesis or my you know, my belief is that people lease because they just it's easier. Right. Um, it's convenient. It's convenient. It's easier. They don't need to deal with the headache. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I think leasing is good for people that know exactly how much they're driving. Right. If you're driving very little or a lot, ownership makes more sense. Um, and there's also this element of like, if you can easily transact and own a car, the reason, I think one of the reasons, well, what we believe is one of the reasons why people don't change cars that often is because it's actually quite annoying and hard to pay the butt, butt yeah. right? So, you know, there's a, there, there's a world where we're like, okay, well, every year we know exactly what you drive and it's like, hey, look, like, 
you know, do you want to upgrade? Or you, you, know, you bring your car into the shop and like, actually, do you, you don't need to return that. You, maybe you don't want even that car back. Here's a new car that you can, you can have for an extra, I don't know, $10 a month or whatever it is, right? Um, and so there's, there's, there's ways, or I think, there's, I think what we're trying to do is make ownership a lot easier so that it isn't as painful to flip in and out of cars. And if you want a new car every six months, super easy. Mm-hmm. I think that's exciting. I think from the consumer standpoint, the willingness to own for the sake of it is diminishing mm-hmm. by the minute. Mm-hmm. But the utility of a vehicle, of course, isn't. So yeah, right. Yeah. That discommensurate is is like opportunity for offering flexibility. Yeah, for sure. And if people could have a, a car subscription, but not have that car come to them from an individual owner and come from a service. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure they would want to rotate their cars all the time yeah. and try out different things. And yeah, no, there's like there's a lot of these models that we can explore. Mm-hmm. I think um, the other thing that I think is important, just in general, in startups generally, is focus. Right. Um, yeah. We could do sure. we can do car sharing. We could do you know subscriptions. We could do those things in theory. But um, you know we've got we've got a, we're building a product around ownership at least today. Yeah. Um, and that's the focus. Uh, and the product we've got, you know, I think really, really high customer satisfaction, uh, and so that's the focus area, and that will remain that focus for at least the foreseeable future. Uh, so, in terms of what people can buy from Clutch, yep. are, is there uh, a certain vintage that you stop at? Yeah, generally nothing older than six, seven years. Okay. Um, and then, and in terms of mileage, you said you want something just under under one hundred twenty k. Most of the cars are under one hundred k. And pricing. Um, average price anywhere between twenty and thirty five thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah. So cool. kind of like, you know, our best sellers are cars like Honda Civics, Toyota Corollas, CRVs, um, Kia Souls. Kia um, Soul. Very popular. I helped with the marketing yeah. campaign for that in Canada. <laughs> that the was, hamsters? Sorry. The hamsters? No, we yeah. built uh, at the time. Uh, we I forget what the catchphrase was, but Kia Soul. Uh, yeah, forget it. But it was the idea was to promote this car as like the every person car. They were kind of rolling it back to like a Volkswagen approach. Yeah. yeah. And um, and so I created with a company. It was in partnership with Flavor Pill, which is interesting because now Sasha Lewis from Flavor Pill's gone on into like interesting advertising stuff. But um, this was new. This wasn't like they came to an agency. This is like we pitched them on something neat. Yeah. Basically, I uh, we built a. Tinder? No, that's the wrong word. <laughs> <laughs> what was it called? Tumblr. Tumblr. We built okay. a Tumblr clone. Okay. The first Tumblr clone when Tumblr was just getting started. Yeah. And the idea was it was it was paired with this kind of big ad spend across North America, and they were trying to get people to kind of like, you know, define whatever the catchphrase was, like what is your soul or what does soul mean yeah, to you? Yeah, yeah. And they'd post all sorts of media onto this site, and anyone well, cool. could post it. So it was like... You know, crowdsourced content. Yeah, uh, and then that would the that stuff would get remixed and put on billboards. Oh, that's cool. Um, so yeah, Kia Soul. Yeah, it's still around. It's still, I mean, very very loyal, popular following. Wow. Um, and so those that's kind of the flavor of cars that that you'd see. Um, but we have you know more unique inventory as well. And you know, you sometimes see. I mean, because we acquire ca- cars from this vast population of people. Yep. Um, you get some pretty cool and unique cars as a result of that. Um. But we've designed our algorithm to also manage inventory, right? So as you know, you can imagine that as yeah, as demand slumps in a particular skew, exactly. you're going to not buy it, right? And yeah. and the, the the value for the you know thirty fifth Honda Civic in our inventory is going to be less than the thirty fourth Honda Civic in our inventory. Man, that's very interesting. The fact that you have that transactional data and it's feeding into your yep. operation. Yeah, and that's the te- I think that's the tech people that people don't see. Um, right. And so we spend. You know, we we truly we are truly a tech company at heart, um, with a lot of operations to support it. But um, you know, that's that's the piece that I think is super powerful and interesting because until now, and particularly in Canada, because the data sets are different. You know, frankly, the the trims and models are different in Canada. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a bunch of regulatory stuff that you know makes it very difficult for you know other folks around the globe to to actually operate in Canada. And mm-hmm. so, um, our 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 vision and ambition is to to create you know, the biggest data set around car values as well. Yeah, because that's a whole another thing that's a bit legacy, right? Yep. 
How do um, how do dealers? Well, I shouldn't say dealers. It's really about car manufacturers. Because in Canada, it seems like there's a mix of brands that have corporate stores mm -hmm. and then brands that license out the kind of dealer function, the sales function. Yeah. Um, how have any of them approached you to partner? Um, it seems like your operations yeah, are so tight. We, if I was like Mercedes, I'd say. <laughs> Can you just handle our used car division? Yeah, we've had we've had a few of these discussions, and we we actually do a little bit of that for some folks. Okay. Um, without disclosing too much, but um, yeah, I think it'll be interesting. To, I think the the evolution of the dealership model will will obviously change in the next next, next ten to fifteen years. I think Tesla for sure is creating a lot of disruption around the dealership model. Um, How so? Because I don't know much about Tesla. They're all corporate stores. Right? They are yeah. okay. So there's no franchise model, um, Interesting. and so because um, I know Mercedes just in the last couple of years got rid of all of their stores. They went the opposite direction in Canada. Yeah, well, I mean, there's some there. There's there's certainly still some that exist. It's corporate. Oh, corporate. Sorry, corporate. They stores. got yeah, yeah, got yeah, rid yeah. of all their corporate stores. Yeah, fair enough. They made um, them all. Yeah, they yeah. sold them to individuals to run. Yeah, and, but there's then there's an element of the direct right. Good people going online and buying the cars directly ah, I see. as well. Right, and so there's like are dealerships then becoming become more of a distribution channel? Are they going to have inventory allocated? I think there's also this element of like, oh, pandemic has accustomed people to waiting five to six months for a car, mm -hmm. and so is there more of like a just in time model for for cars? And as as a result, is the is, is the inventory that dealerships holding or that is the inventory that dealerships hold going to be just much less than it was in the past. Sure. Um, Come more of a showroom. Right. Right. So here's a sense of like, you know, you go to a Tesla location, it's like, here's your Model S, your Model Y, and you know, your your Model 3, you can make some tweaks to it and you'll have it delivered in a couple months. How are rental car companies faring in this like supply restriction or restricted market? Um, I don't really have a strong sense. It's not really a market. We we used to be closer to the rental car market because we buy at auction. And so a lot of the rental cars that would come off, uh, the rental car lots would come into auction, then we'd buy them. Um, yeah. I think more recently, um, the supply is, supply is now kind of, I wouldn't say fully back to normal, but still at decent levels. And so I would imagine, again, this is not an area that I've spent a right. lot of time on. I would imagine that like Rental cars are still acquiring cars from directly from OEMs. There's a time when rental car companies were actually buying from auction, which is the opposite of what was happening before. Hmm. Um, but that's reversed. It's super interesting. There's lots of opportunity. What about on the finance side? Like I would think a vendor like you would be a preferred financial throughput for yeah. so insurance half, yeah. companies yeah. and everyone else. So half our business is fintech. Okay. And so the business model is we basically we make um, – uh, anywhere between about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars on the metal, right? Okay. And so that's you know that's and dealers will actually make significantly more. And what do you mean you make it on the metal? Meaning the the car. Okay. So the the spread between what we buy oh, and I see what, what we sell mean. it yeah. after the metal. We, that's a pretty. Yeah. Yeah. That's a cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that cool? Phraseology <laughs> there, man. <laughs> right. So that's 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 part of their business. The other part of the business is all the ancillary products that okay. we that we provide. So financing, uh, insurance, and warranty. Mm. Um, and so I think a lot of people have this misconception, um, and a lot of dealers, um, more traditional dealers will make most of their money on the financing. And right. so there's, there's, I think a lot of consumers have this misconception. It's like, I'll pay you cash. Give me a discount. Mm -hmm. The reality is actually, there's no room to give them a discount. We, we don't, we don't want your cash. We actually want you to finance the vehicle. Right. Right. And so that's 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 a little bit of a I would say just popular misconception around the industry. And so I think one of the things we're trying to do is be very transparent about how we make money and where we make money because there's so many times where I think a lot of people come off come out of a car transaction and say, oh wow, like we I, I, did, I had a great deal. Well, well, maybe you didn't because you actually got you know, really screwed on your trade-in value, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Or you know you're you're in a you haven't, you didn't do the math, and actually you're you're paying an interest rate that's much higher than you actually should be paying. Right. right? You might get the car at the price you wanted, but you're actually paying more interest, or you know you've bought a bunch of products that you may or may not need. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a lot of ways for you to for you know traditional dealers to triangulate around where 
you're going to extract your dollar from the consumer. And and there's a lot of, you know, like this is another thing. You, you mentioned that there isn't much transparency or historically hasn't been, right, in many things mm-hmm. like to do with the mm-hmm. valuation of cars and, and even in the traditional kind of resale market yep. that's formalized. So dealers or, you know, these places by the side of the road all over the place, yep. you know, jumbies flying in air and and all these for sale signs and discount and, and all that stuff. Um, there's a lot of shysters in that market. Because yeah. Because there's a lot of very sketchy secondary finance outfits and even mafia money uh, in that industry from what I've seen. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's certainly a subset of, you know, professional upstanding individuals, but there's also, it's, it's fraught with, you know, folks that are, you know, probably less so uh, and... Um, you see a lot of that behavior and it, it's frankly, it's, that's one of the reasons why we started and we're building clutch is to provide that transparency. And, you know, because we have fixed pricing, right? Mm -hmm. You go on our website, the price is the price. The price is the same for you as is for the next person as for the next person. And because we believe that just because you're better at negotiating or just, you know, you have more time or you have more patience for it or you're, or, or more savvy, you should be getting a better price, right? Like what, in what? There's so few things in the world that actually yeah. operate like that. Why well, gamify you know, all this stuff? Just keep it simple. You know, so here's the price. You know, here's the value of your trade in. Here's the financing you get. Here's the price for these warranties. Like we're trying to be as transparent as possible, because um, there's there's too much opportunity right now. I think to decouple a lot of these things and uh, or couple a lot of these things together and kind of like wave your hand over here and be like, hey, this mm-hmm. is all great. But actually on the other side, you're like, well, this is not, you're not actually getting a great deal. Um, and so again, I think what, what consu- the only thing consumers can ask for is transparency, right? And say, hey, look, like where are these fees coming from? What are you charging for? What is the price? You know, what are these things that I'm getting? Um, we provide a inspection report for the car. So what's been done to the car? Uh, here's the Carfax, so here's the complete vehicle history. So you've got all the data and all the details, so um, you can walk away feeling pretty confident about the transaction. So from early career in finance, yeah, right, a little bit of like M and A and that kind of stuff, banking stuff. Yep. Uh, into looking at transport in different ways. Yep. Through Uber, to now becoming kind of an entrepreneur uh, by invitation. Uh, to run this company that combines these two things, uh, where do you see your own interests lying these days? Uh, obviously, within your product mix and your service and the running of the company, but like, how has your vision of like you know or the perspective on on transport and the industry and and even your own career kind of like changed? Um, Is it fair to ask? I know when you're in the thick of a company, it's like all you live and breathe. Yeah, I think, um, like, I love what I'm doing. Um, I think the building part is super fun, and we talked about this before before the show. The building is really fun. Um, And personally, I get a lot of satisfaction about building a consumer brand Mm -hmm. because you see it. We call it in the wild, right? You yeah. See it in the oh, wild. It's nice right? to be behind a car and yeah. you see a clutch oh, logo yeah. Yeah. on it, right? Yeah. And we actually, like, you know, we have a pretty uh, healthy uh, Slack channel that every time someone oh. sees something, like, oh, here's one in the wild. This is the one that we, you know, and so they, 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 I think the team gets a, a kick out of it. Um, and also, you know, seeing our, our, you know, partnerships with, with the NBA and things like that are also really cool in terms of building a consumer brand. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I really like that. And I think that's something that's carried over from actually my time at Uber. Um, and then teams, I think the, you know, that we couldn't be doing and we couldn't be where we are with the people, without the people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've always been back into, you know, student government and, you know, leading, leading teams. So yeah. full circle. Yeah. Um, I've really loved leading teams and, and, um, and, you know, I think, combining building a consumer brand with building people's careers is something that I get a lot of satisfaction about. Like yeah. when I think about my time at Uber, the, 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 the number of, I think there's been at least, you know, three or four, if not more, probably like five or six folks from my kind of like Uber class mm-hmm. in Canada that have gone on to either start companies or be CEOs of companies. Um, and, I think that's a result of having built and scaled, you know, a multi-billion dollar business. And my hope and my aspiration is that if in 10 years from now or five years from now, the folks that we have on the team can go off and 
do their own thing or right. have their resumes and their career prospects improved as a result of having had the experience of building something that you know a lot of Canadians recognize. That to me is like that's that's my life's work, and that's that's if this is the only thing I do, then that's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, nice man. Yeah, I think that's great. Right. Thanks for joining me in the studio. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was right fun. On. Right, All right on. Cool.